Hi, boys and girls. Okay, we are on Babe Chapter 8, Oh Ma. And I'll admit, this is a little bit hard of a chapter for me. It's like the climax of the story. Okay. Fly's suspicions about what the farmer was up to grew rapidly over the next few weeks. It soon became obvious to her that he was constructing on his own a practice course. From the top of the field where the rustlers had come, the circuit which he had laid out ran all around the farm, studded with ha hazards to be negotiated. Some were existing gateways or gaps, S some he made, with hurdles or lines of posts between which the sheep had to be driven. Some were extremely difficult. One, for example, a plank bridge over a stream was so narrow that it could only be crossed in a single file line. And the most honeyed words were needed from Babe to persuade the animals to cross. Then in the home paddock, Hoggett made a rough shedding ring with a circle of large stones and beyond it a final pen, a small hurdle enclosure no bigger than a tiny room with the gate which was to close when he pulled on a rope. Every day the farmer would send Fly to cut out five sheep from the flock and take them to the top of the hill and hold them there. Then starting Babe from the gate at the lower end of the farmyard, Hoggett would send him away to run through the course. Away to me, pig, he would say, or come by, pig. And off Babe would scamper as fast as his trotters could carry him. As the farmer pulled out his big old pocket watch and noted the time, there was only one problem. His trotters would not carry him very fast at all. Here at home, Fly realized his lack of speed didn't matter much. Whichever five sheep were selected were only too anxious just to oblige Babe and would hurry eagerly to do whatever he wanted. But with strange sheep, it would be different, thought Fly, if the boss really does intend to run a, in a trial, which it looks as if he does. She watched Babe's tubby pink white shape as he crested the hill. That evening at supper time, she watched again as he truck, tucked into his food. Up till now, it had never worried her how much he ate. He's a growing boy, she had thought fondly. Now she thought, he's a greedy boy too. Babe, she said, as with a grunt of contrast, he licked the last morsels of the end of his snout. His little tin trough was as shiny clean as though Mrs. Hoggett had washed it in her sink, and his tummy was as tight as a drum. Yes, Mum. You like being a sheep pig, don't you? Oh, yes, Mum. And you'd like to be really good at it, wouldn't you? The greatest, better than any other sheep pig. Do you think there are others? Well, no, better than any sheep dog then. Oh yes, I'd love to be better than any other sheep dog, but I don't really think that's possible. You see, although sheep do seem to behave well for me and do what I ask, I mean, do what I tell them, I'm nowhere near as fast as a dog and never will be. No, but you could be jolly sight faster than you are. How? Well, there are two things you'd have to do. First, you'd have to go into proper training. One little run around a day is not enough. You'd have to practice hard, jogging, cross-country running, sprinting, distance work. I'll help you, of course. It all sounded like fun to Babe. Great, he said, but you said two things. What's the second? Eat less, said Fly. You'd have to go on a diet. Any ordinary pig would have rebelled at this point. Pigs enjoy eating, and they also enjoy lying around most of the day thinking about eating again. But Babe was no ordinary pig, and he set out enthusiastically to do what Fly suggested. Under his watchful eye, he ate wisely, but not too well, and he, every afternoon he trained to a program which she had worked out, trotting right around the borders of the farm, perhaps, or running up to the top of the hill and back again, or racing up and down the home paddock. Hoggett thought that the pig was just playing, but he couldn't help noticing how he had grown, <clears throat> not fatter as a sty kept pig would have done, but stronger and more wiry. There was nothing of the piglet about him anymore. He looked lean and racy and hard muscled, and he was now almost as big as the sheep he herded, and the day came when that strength and hardness were to stand him in good stead. One beautiful morning when the sky was as clear and cloudless and the air so crisp and fresh that you could almost taste it, Babe woke feeling on the top of the world like a trained athlete. He felt so charged with ener energy that he simply couldn't keep still. He bounced around the stable floor on all four feet, shaking his head and uttering a series of short, sharp squeaks. You're full of it this morning, said Fly with a yawn. You'd better run up to the top of the hill and back to work it off. Okay, Mum, said Babe, and off he shot while Fly settled comfor comfortably back in the straw. Dashing across the home paddock, 
spade bounded up the hill and looked about for the sheep. Though he knew he would see them later on, he felt so pleased with life that he thought he would like to share that feeling with Ma and the others before he ran home again. Hello, good morning, everybody. Isn't it a lovely day? They were, he knew, in the most distant of all the fields on the farm, up at the top of the lane. He looked across, expecting that they would be grazing quietly or lying comfortably and cuddled in the morning sun, only to see them galloping madly in every direction. On the woof breeze came cries of woof, but that but not in the usual bored, almost automatic tones of a complaint that used when fly would work them. These were yells of real terror, desperate calls for help. And as he watched, two other animals came in sight, one large, one small, and he heard the sound of barking and yapping as they dashed around after the sheep. You get some wolves as as I'll chase them and keep them and kill them. Ma's exact words came back to Babe. And without a second thought, he set off as fast as he could in the direction of the noise. What a sight greeted him when he arrived at the far field. The flock, usually so tightly bunched, was scattered everywhere, eyes bulging, mouths open, heads hanging in their evident stress. And it was clear that the dogs had been at their worrying for some time. A few sheep had tried their terror in terror to jump the wire fencing and had become caught up in it. Some had fallen into the ditches and gotten stuck. Some were limping as they ran about, and on the grass were lumps of wool torn from the others. Most dreadful of all, in the middle of the field, the warriors had brought down a ewe, which lay on its side, feebly kicking at them as they growled and tugged at it. On the day when the rustlers had come, Babe had felt a mixture of fear and terror and anger. Now he knew nothing but blind rage. He charged flat out the two dogs, grunting and snorting with fury. Nearest to him was the smaller dog, a kind of mongrel terrier, which was snapping at one of the ewes behind legs, deaf to everything in the excitement of the worry. Before it could move, Babe took it across the back and flung it to one side. The force of his rush carried him on to the bigger dog and knocked it flying. This one, a large black crossbreed, part collie, part retriever, was ma made of sterner stuff than the terrier, which was already running dazedly away. It picked itself up and came snarling back at Pig. Perhaps in the confusion of the moment, it thought that this was just another sheep that had somehow found courage to attack it. But if so, it knows it soon would know better. For as it came on, Babe chomped at it with his terrible pig bite and the bite that grips and tears. And now it was not sheep's blood that was spilled. Howling in pain, the black dog turned and ran, his tail between his legs. He ran, in fact, for his life as open mouth bristling Pig hard on his heels. The fear was clear, and Babe suddenly came back to his senses. He turned and hurried to the fallen ewe, round whom now all the dogs had gone, and hurt the horrified flock was beginning to gather in a rough circle. She lay still now as Babe stood panting by her side, a draggled side where the warriors had pulled at it, and suddenly he realized it was Ma. Ma, he cried, Ma, are you all right? She did not seem too badly hurt. He could not see any gaping wounds though blood was coming from one ear where the dogs had bitten at it. The old ewe opened an eye. Her voice, when she spoke, was as hoarse as ever, but now not much more than a whisper. Hello, young'un, she said. Babe dropped his head and gently licked the ear to try to stop the bleeding, and some blood stuck to his snout. Can you get up, he asked. For some time, Ma did not answer. He looked anxiously at her, but the eye that he could see was still open. I don't reckon, she said. It's all right, Ma, Babe said. The wolves have gone far away. Far, 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 chorused the flock. And Fly and the boss will soon be here to look after you. Ma made no answer or movement. Only her ribs jumped to the thump of her tired old heart. You'll be all right. Honestly, you will, said Babe. Oh, said Ma. And then the eye closed and the ribs jumped no more. Oh, Ma, said Babe. Ma, Ma, Ma. Ah, more the flock, and the Land Rover came up to the lane. Farmer Hoggett had heard nothing of the worrying, and the field was far too was far too far away. The wind in the wrong direction, but he had been anxious, and so by now was Fly, because Pig was nowhere to be found. The moment they entered the field, both man and dog could see that something was terribly wrong. Why else was the flock so obviously distressed, panting and gasping and disheveled? Why had they formed that ragged circle, and what was in the middle of it? Farmer Hoggett strode forward, fly before him, panting, parting the ring to make way. 
only to see a sight that struck horror in the hearts of both. There before them lay a dead ewe, and bending over it was Pig, his snout, almost touching the outstretched neck, a snout they saw that was stained with blood. Chapter 8. As you can see, that's a hard chapter to read. Very, very sad. And now he has blood on his snout. So you can think about what Farmer Hoggett's thinking. We're going to have to talk about that.